these are these are things that science can can uh, uh, modulate, can come up with numbers, etc. But it's very much fits in a political context, and therefore it's very nice to be able to now switch over uh, to Christian Christian Asar. Um, he's a professor in Envi energy and environment at Chalmers. Uh, he's acted as a policy advisor to two Swedish prime ministers and to all Swedish environment ministers between 2002 and 2014. You've also been, uh, so you've been heavily engaged in interacting with the poli policy makers, reaching out to them, bringing your knowledge and engaging. So I very much look forward to hearing what you have to say on this. In the introduction of the report, to which we are referring all the time, the future is now, uh, is it in, yes, there you see it. Uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland says that speaking of the six entry points for collaborative action to achieve Agenda 2030, that scientific expertise and innovation can be brought to bear and yield impressive results, but the determining factor will always be political will. So Christian, is this a controversial or a very trivial statement? And uh, what does it, how do you apply it in your thinking? So Christian, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Olaf, for your nice introduction. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here and to be able to talk to all of you at this uh, conference. Uh, and I will talk about science and democracy or science and policy and democracy and more specifically uh, with the focus on climate change. But I, if there is time, I will also hope to be able to say a few words about Corona also because there is some similarities here in the rhetorics when it comes to climate and science and Corona and science. And uh, when it comes to you, just to answer your question also before I start talking about my own presentation, uh, I absolutely think it's crucial uh, with political will because we need to set rules to maybe increase the cost of emitting CO2 so that we change uh, the incentives so companies move from fossil fuels to renewables or other low carbon technologies. Um, but I also I think that it's too much to say that it, it always will boil down to political will because some changes take place also without political decisions and particularly when new technologies come in, then the policy setting arena react to changes that happens in the world rather than drive them. So, but, but I agree that political will is crucial for solving many of the big challenges we're facing now. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to start with um, sort of two iconic images of the climate problem. This first graph is the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere over the past 2000 years. So this is like when, when Jesus was born and onwards. And then we see the concentration of CO2 has been very flat for almost 1,800, 900 years. And then with the onset of the industrial revolution, we start to burn fossil fuels and we start to cut down forests, which both of these two activities lead to releases of CO2. CO2 goes up into the atmosphere and the concentration start to increase. And we see how fast that increase is. And the closer in time we get to the current state, the faster it goes up. So uh, clearly human activities cause a very big change in, in, the, in the atmospheric concentration of CO2. And we know from science that CO2 has the capacity to absorb heat radiation. So with more CO2, the initial response from the Earth is that uh, less heat is radiated from the, uh, from the Earth to the, ocean, to the atmosphere or to the universe than what comes in from the sun. So the earth has to warm. And we can see that in the next slide. Uh, so next, please. Um, that the temperature of the earth has also gone up. Uh, so this shows the last 140 years. And in particular, since 1960, 70, the temperature has gone up. And both those two graphs clearly demonstrate the human impact, uh, the impact we humans have on the atmosphere and on the total earth system. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so then we, we come to uh, 
uh, first, what are the risks? And we know from scientific studies of coral reefs that they are, uh, there is a huge risk for them. We know that hurricanes might become more intense. Uh, there are a huge number of impacts and the more detailed assessment of the impacts or the detailed scale, like the more specific things we look at, the higher is the uncertainty about the actual impact. So we know very short CO2 has gone up. We know for sure that the temperature has gone up. But when we start to talk about the specific impacts, then uncertainty start to grow. Um, then science has also a very important role in, in analyzing the potential mitigation options. What can we do to solve this problem? So here I have illustrated this with two technologies, uh, solar uh, and wind, which may play a very, very important role in reducing the, the emissions and therefore also mitigate all the climate, future climate impacts. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this was just like a very, very brief background. Um, the, there are big questions now uh, about what we should do about it. Because uh, we need to, in some way, try to understand what will happen, how severe are those impacts. And then we need to look at, OK, what can we do about it? How uh, much should we reduce? How fast can we do it? What will it cost? What are the social impacts? Who will win and lose, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a huge number of questions where we need, of course, not only natural scientists, but everything from philosophers to sociologists to behavioral economists, et cetera, and as well as engineers, et cetera, et cetera. So my, my focus for this presentation is how we shall decide. How, what kind of, how, how should we make a decision about what to do about this problem? And uh, next slide, please. So here I have two, two statements uh, in Swedish, unfortunately, but uh, I assume most of you understand, but I will translate also. So there's a very common line of argument now in society where people say as the first uh, uh, article here is that science has to uh, like come before politics. We have to, to have, like we have, really have to make sure that we decide this using science, not politics. And uh, this is a very common argument. This is from Dongis Nyete, where one journalist writes this. As, and I think that that reflects how common it is that they can write that uh, without it being controversial. And then there is a statement also from uh, Professor Johan Rockström, who says that um, the science has, uh, established that the climate demands that we do uh, this or that. So these are two common statements. And then next slide. Uh, we also have a similar statement, but this one is definitely milder from Greta Thunberg, uh, which has her been her like favorite line of argument, which is I think is uh, like extremely smart. She says, listen to the scientists and of course, everybody has to agree we should listen to the scientists. Uh, but I, what I think she also says is that we should not just listen to the scientists. We should also do what they tell us to do. And that might be more controversial. Uh, next slide. And then we have uh, uh, the president-elect, uh, Joe Biden, who, in when it comes to corona, uh, says, uh, let's set partisan uh, aside, let's end the politics and follow the science. And of course, this is very much in line with what Greta says, we should listen to the scientists. But he also says we should not only listen to the scientists, he basically say we should largely do what the scientists tell us to do, but he doesn't say that explicitly. So there's like less strong, less stringent case than what the two first uh, slides said. Um, so next slide. Um, of course, there's a lot of critique against this approach. Uh, there is one uh, professor, uh, his name is Mike Holm. He argued like already 10 years ago, because this argument has been around for a very long time. And he says, we must stop saying that science demands. Uh, his argument is, is that it doesn't. And then there was a recent article in uh, Nature, uh, which uh, the title is the rhetorical limitations of the Fridays for future of the Friday for the future movement. And um, 
here, uh, this, uh, this author uh, says he has great admiration for Greta Thunberg and the entire movement, but he also has problems with the rhetoric that we should listen to the scientists. He said that there's a, a severe problem with that. So next slide, please. So uh, as I guess you have understood, I also think that this rhetoric is very problematic. So I want to I want to uh, now dwell a little bit on why this sort of science demands that we have to follow the scientists' uh, opinions. Why that rhetoric is uh, wrong, and the fundamental reason is that. Science is a method to find out what the world is like. It's a method to describe how the world, uh, the, the functioning of the world, and here I mean both the natural world and also our societies. So science dis can describe how the world works. It can also describe the consequences of our actions, but it cannot say what we should do about it. There's like, we cannot do set up an empirical experiment or a model or anything to try and figure out, okay, what should we do about this problem? Because that is ultimately an ethical and a moral question, what we should do about something. And for that reason, it's also a political question. So uh, the only way, reasonable way to resolve what we should do about the problem is to, to uh, we have to involve ethical and moral judgments. And this goes back a very long uh, way in history. Uh, David Hume is uh, often credited for being one of the first, but it goes even further back in time. And he is the Scottish philosopher. He said, you cannot derive an ought from an is. So if we have a description of the world, we know if we do A and B, like assume we, we have this uh, scenario, if we emit certain amounts of CO2 emissions, then there will be certain impact on sea level rise and drought and maybe refugees or what have you. Uh, then if we choose another path, we emit much, much less or much, much worse, more, uh, then we have an other impact. Which out of those two choices we should choose, that's an ethical choice, not a scientific choice. Um, and the same thing with Corona, sometimes in the argumentation you hear like, uh, are school closures an effective way of dealing with the problem? Well, science can say, like, if there is no even, I mean, now we have a lot of uncertainty also, but assume we have full certainties, then science can say, like, if we close all the schools, maybe the infection rate will drop by this and that. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we should do it, because there are other things that we have to balance that against, and that is like, the well-being of kids, their, their psychological well-being, the impact on their long-term education, et cetera, et cetera. So those two things have to be balanced against one another. And that is not a task for an epidemiologist or somebody who's an expert on microbiology or virus or vaccines or something. That's a ethical, political choice we have to decide between competing interests. So that is one reason why the science demand is rhetoric is wrong. Uh, second, uh, next please. Um, uh, so the or that is then why is this important? Well, it's important because the science demands rhetoric is problematic from a democratic point of view. Because if we say that science should decide how to choose between different complicated ethically questions, then there is no role for democracy and. I don't want a society where science experts determine what to do about complicated ethical problems. And it's in particular important in the context of climate change, where activists, activists and others tell us that we have to basically change almost the entire, almost our entire way of life. That would then mean that a small group of experts would set the rules for how seven, eight, or nine, soon 10 billion people will have to live their lives. And that, that's not democratic. So I, I think that that is a problem. Next. Um, it's also important because since I believe that science cannot do this, uh, and if we start to say that science can do that, and if we voice political opinions as if they were scientific facts, 
then there is actually a risk that we undermine trust in science because then we would be saying things that are not fully true. And also if we say such things, we do contribute to the polarization of science, which I don't want to see and which uh, we are, um, a lot of people often are very concerned that people like uh, Trump or right-wing populists are doing. So we should, who are in the science community should be careful not to like give them arguments here. Uh, next slide, please. So in, um, in, in, that context, in that context, it's also interesting to look at what the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, says. On the, and it's important to note that they are never policy prescriptive. They never say like, we have to reduce emissions by this much, or uh, and we have to get down to zero by a certain period there, or and we have to meet like a 1.5 or 2 degree target. Those targets are uh, policy targets. The 1.5 to 2 degree target is a uh -huh. political target from Paris. It's not a scientific target from the IPCC. Um, I think one of the reasons why IPCC has been successful is that they like kept to the science and tried to be uh, policy relevant, but not being policy prescriptive. Um, I think another problem with the science should tell us or science demands is that there's the question, which scientists should we listen to? Uh, on this slide, there is one scientist who won the Nobel Prize in economics. I, I did like this because it's not really a Nobel Prize. It's called that in Swedish, but it's often. And it's William Nordhaus. He argues that the optimal temperature response to the climate problem is 3.5 degrees. But another scientist, Jim Hansen, argues for a very stringent target. So the question is, if we should follow the science, which scientists and who should elect those we should listen to. Uh, next slide. So uh, Olaf and everybody else, uh, here are my, my final conclusions. So scientific knowledge is crucial. It's absolutely important to help decision making in our complex societies. And some decisions like very pure technical decisions, such as how to operate an electricity grid, nuclear power plants with medicines work and not, et cetera must of course be made by experts. Uh, I didn't, I do not want to get operated. Like I don't want to operate my need, uh, have that operation made by a policymaker. Of course I need an expert there. So we shall listen to the scientists and the expert, but science does not say what we should do about climate change, Corona, et cetera. That's ultimately democratic, hence a uh, political question. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm sorry if I, uh, no worries, no worries, Christian. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, your uh, uh, presentation, sending strong uh, and for clarifying a bit this debate that, that we hear a lot about, about listening to the scientists and, and uh, how we should differentiate between an ought from an is. Uh, it's definitely worth keeping an eye on and we are getting lots of comments in the chat.